cord. Oh, Joey. Yeah. Great. I'll uh, I'll leave it to you, uh, Jacob and Flavio, to start whenever you you like. Mm -hmm. Feel right. free to join if you ever get bored. So we'll be here. Maybe we can go around while while we wait for people to join. We can go around um, and and uh, hear from who you are <laughs> and tell us a little bit about yourself and your interests. In this breakout uh, session. <laughs> sure, I'll start and we can like kind of do a popcorn method where we say someone's name, right? So my name is Jacob. I'm actually in good old Alabama. I'm a graduate student and I'm going to try to have a conversation with you all alongside my, you know, partner in arms, Flavio. Um, we're really excited to talk with you all, have conversations with you all. Um, yeah. So I'll pass it off to uh, Roland. Okay, hi, uh, I'm Ronald Sparkley. Uh, I teach uh, management accounting and control at Nine Road Business University. I also teach um, uh, classes applied research methods there. Um, and of course, I'm also forced now to think about how to do that online. So I'm really interested in hearing what you've got to say about that. Uh, Suzette, do you wanna go? Sure, Suzette Reed, I'm in Chicago. Well, the burbs, thank goodness, given our social unrest lately. Um, so we're okay out here. I run a PhD program in community psychology. I teach the methods course, but I also teach it at the master's level for many programs, industrial organizational psych, human resource management, general psych, and at the undergrad level. I kind of like research methods. So, And I've been teaching online for a really long time, but this incorporation of synchronous blended is a whole different beast. Man. All right, Suzette, if you had to pick someone, who would you pick? I didn't do the popcorn. Or going with Joanna. She's right below me. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jo Lake. I uh, work at the Economic and Social Research Council. It's UK Research and Innovation. Um, I think, as was mentioned in the session, we co-funded the QSEP program in the UK with Nuffield, um, and I look after our research methods portfolio within the council. So I'm here interested to learn a bit more about what's been going on, how people are uh, responding to some of the challenges, particularly with online learning in the pandemic. All right, Raluca, do you want to go? Sure. Um, hi, I'm Raluca. Um, I teach research methods and statistics at the University of Exeter. Uh, mostly to masters and doctoral clinical psychologists. So uh, beyond the challenges of kind of moving everything online is motivating students uh, also to kind of do research because they generally think it's not needed. Um, so, but I'm here to pick up tips on how to do that as well. Thanks. All right. Uh, should we try Plavia Nitov? Yeah, that, that's a very long name, sorry. So I am Pallavi Banerjee. I uh, lead the MSc program at the University of Exeter. Absolutely delighted to meet another colleague from Exeter here. Uh, I teach research methods uh, across a range of master's courses and courses for PhD students. So yeah, uh, looking forward to pick up some uh, tips for, uh, which will be very helpful for our students. All right, Paul Wax, would you like to go? We're just presenting each other. Hi, sorry, I, I just got here. I'm uh, Paul Watts. I'm a senior lecturer in public health, um, teaching lots of epidemiology stats to uh, undergrad and master students. All right, so I'll give it a go. Give it a go. My name is Flavio Azevedo. I founded uh, um, an organization that is uh, focused on education called FORT. Um, it stands for Framework of Open and Reproducible Science uh, uh, Research Training. And uh, we basically are trying to integrate the principles of open science and reproducible science into higher education. So I think it's, it's very relevant when it comes to, um, uh, to the topics dis discussed in, in, in this uh, 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 workshop uh, event, but also uh, more generally. And it's, it's especially easy um, to do that for methods, but uh, a lot of our um, audience is more social sciences rather than 
the methods per se, and uh, where a lot of people have forgotten about the craft of teaching and why is it that we're teaching and what we're teaching people to think rather than the, the so-called facts of science. So this is more or less the, the, the lens of these discussions here. And um, we would like now to, to get a little bit of your expectations. Uh, we wanna be useful to you. So um, if some of you could uh, come forward and say, well, I would like to learn about this and maybe, maybe we could, uh, our experience uh, with this organization may be helpful for you. Yeah, so just to echo that and clarify, we're really trying to gather just like expectations. What do you want out of this breakout session? As well, you said we are from for an organization, which we have several initiatives. And kind of based on those expectations that you provide, we can then start talking about like what resources are there available for you, if that makes sense. So really, we don't want us to have like a very structured, strong outline. We really want you all to lead the conversation because um, we're all in this together, right? And I think it's amazing that you all care enough about teaching and pedagogy to try to like I'm still trying to improve, right? Like, look at this, I'm young. So I think it's crazy across all the age groups that we're all trying to better ourselves. I think one of the, th the things that was in the chat in the bigger breakout room was, these are all great ideas. It takes a lot of time researching everything. And for me, it's like, how many tweaks are you making this term? Um, how, you know, unless you're doing a complete course overhaul and I know there's not one answer to this, but you know, I even just looking at the, oh, there's Ed Puzzle and there's HS5P and there's Play Pots. Like, okay, there's three days of my life. <laughs> um, so I don't know if you have any advice on, okay, if there was one thing you were to do next term, here's an easy win. Like the waterfall chats are a small win. That's an easy thing I could do next week. Um, any suggestions on that from anybody? Where to spend your time and energy when it's limited? Um, in our opinion, um, that would go on uh, bringing on students on how to think critically about the science that they are learning. Literally trying to integrate as much as possible their input into the process of science making and making them active partners with you along the way. So th those are more or less the, the ideas enshrined um, uh, that I think are most important in higher education and that we sort of forgot. Okay. Not us, we, we are doing <laughs> workshops about teaching. We, we all know about this, but you know what I mean. So Susette, to clarify your two concerns or two things I noticed was one, time consumption, a lot of time is needed to be invested and two activities that you can do to kind of save that time, correct? Yeah. So to clarify the four organization that we're both volunteers for or Flavi was a co-founder of, one of the initiatives we have is essentially an educational nexus, right? So think of like a large database full of hundreds of articles, including activities, um, teacher statements. So essentially exemplar teachers on what they've done during these times that we can, that Again, we believe in like collaboration and community led things. So these are people who volunteer like, hey, here's what I did. This may aid some of you all. Um, and in addition, because there's a lot of stuff when it comes to teaching about open science, getting, um, trying to get students invested um, with accessible articles, open articles. I know one initiative we have is essentially something called the 100 plus summaries project where instead of us just simply providing you like bullet point articles to read or like large PDFs to read, our members or volunteers have actually gone and created those summaries to save you all time, um, to essentially get the main takeaway points about these different teaching articles to see if it's quickly relevant to you or not. Um, because nobody has time to read hundreds of 20 plus page PDF articles, at least I don't. Um, so hopefully that uh, addresses your question a little bit, if that helps. I assume we'll figure out how to get access to that. <laughs> it's completely uh, online. It's completely free. You already have ac access uh, access to it. Um, but I can copy and paste the link directly if you. That's yeah. great. Okay. Yeah. Any other good questions, comments, concerns? And again, if any of you all have advice for Suzette or want to share your personal trials, tribulations, solutions, feel free to as well. 
I was wondering, Flavia and Jacob, if you can uh, speak a little bit about um, the open and reproducibility aspect and how to incorporate some of those principles into teaching. I think that's for methods, especially, that's a, a principle that, that should be taught. All right, so the idea of uh, open science is, is, is well, for, first of all, is that everything should be open. Uh, the processes of uh, that we make science should be open. It's, it's not only about methods, but it's how we arrive at conclusions. It's to think critically about what we consider to be the facts of science. And um, when we incorporating uh, this sort of philosophy, so think of uh, Mortonian norms, think of um, uh, uh, works that speak about philosophy of science, we try to put those into the, oh, Jacob has posted uh, the link, just FYI. Um, that's our database there. Um, so, so that is the, the, the idea. When it comes to reproducibility, the idea is that uh, we are able to incorporate ideas of checking each other's work, exercises, putting students on a collaborative uh, uh, sphere where there, there is less hierarchy and that they can arrive at a, at a end product by the end of, uh, of the class session, for example. So it is sort of exactly the things we're learning about uh, open and reproducible science in our research practices. We're trying to apply the same things um, to our teaching formats, hoping that uh, we're gonna sort of teach students how to do science and that they can be recoup, that, that, that knowledge can be recouped in two ways. At least uh, we hope that one as better consumers of science because when they leave higher ed, they, they, they are consumers of science and especially in today's uh, political social uh, sphere that seems to be important. And also with uh, the growth, exponential growth may I add of um, uh, citizen science. So. This is, this is more or less uh, what we have to say about open and reproducible science applied to education. So a, a question to, um, to, to the group or the participants. <laughs> um, have you, like, do, do you include something, some like part, are, is any part of your uh, module about uh, how, to, how to do research that's reproducible? And how do you teach that? Or what, what are the challenges you're having um, about around teaching that part of research? And as a tag along question, also I'm just curious on like your general knowledge about the open science movement, um, sometimes it's called the replication crisis and whatnot, um, but that's pretty prevalent to any type of stats and methodology courses. So I'd be curious to kind of like get a knowledge base or how comfortable you feel talking about those topics. I, in all honesty, with my student body, and I haven't said my university, so I'll say this, I'm lucky to make sure they know what a variable is. I mean, the whole idea of diving deeper into, if they get descriptive correlational quasi-experimental, what a variable is, I've won. Um, so yeah, no, I don't do anything on extra. I mean, if they write their methods section well, it could be replicated, but other than that, no, we don't do, sadly. Um. Anybody else has a, a similar experience or do you feel that the time that you have to accomplish your teaching is also a lot of content in little time? Paul, do you have any thoughts? I mean, in epidemiology, I, <laughs> I presume that's quite important. My, my answer is probably similar to uh, Suzette. Um, yeah, it's, it's a challenge to, to get the basics um, done within quite a, a packed curriculum. Um, but in, in terms of replication, um, at least kind of demonstrating when they have the same data and the, the same question, they should all come to the same answer, I suppose. That's uh, that's about as close as we get. Interesting. I know as far as like resources we have for like open science stuff um, amongst that nexus that I think I shared earlier, 
Like one example would be something along the lines of this. I just posted a link, but we're really promoting like open, reproducible, transparent science because these are things that you can assign to students to have um, and play with the data themselves, right? So there's large databases available to you where you can demonstrate things, visualizations on what it means for a strong correlation, a weak correlation, or what it means to um, sample from a population and how different results based on that sample can occur, demonstrating like where stats can go right, but also where stats can go wrong. So I just kind of wanted to showcase an example of, even if, like Suzette said, like small baby steps to achieve those like little goals of knowing what a variable is, knowing like a quasi experiment versus a true experiment are, are accomplished. I still feel like there are ways where you can include like open science practices and open science databases to assign to your students for you to work with in front of your students to show like stats is a messy business. Um, it's not so clean cut um, as we would like to think. I meant that there's inherent uncertainty, I mean, by the nature of statistics, right? So just as one example of things to consider. I'm curious, are there any other kind of concerns um, beyond time consumption or perhaps uh, activities, just general um, trials and challenges that you all face when it comes to online teaching? I believe. I believe in embracing the awkward. It's okay, y'all. We're both instructors, but we're also kind of like on the students' uh, end right now, where we're waiting for that one person to speak. I um, perhaps uh, uh, we can hear from some of the people that joined after we did our introduction. So, Shara Elder, um, Helen. Tell us a little bit maybe about yourself and about um, the challenges you're having around either teaching something to do with reproducibility and open science, incorporating that into your class um, or anything else, teaching online. She can't speak. So she's saying, I teach research methods for undergraduate students, or that's for everyone? Only in our group, right? Oh, simultaneously listening to two webinars. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> All right. <laughs> that's, uh, Sorry, that's little... I, I just wanted to say, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay, I just wanted to say something because it's it just is a little bit awkward. I am. I was floating through the different breakout rooms, so I kind of feel like oh, what? <laughs> so I feel like I've been outed or something. So I'm sorry. I don't really have a question to present. I was just kind of floating around and. No, that's that's good. So, so that's a question. A question then for you. Um, do you? Uh, what what are you teaching? Oh. At what level are you teaching? Okay, and this is the other side of it. So I saw this course this course online. And so I am actually just starting my teaching career and I have not been assigned a research methods class. And I, I saw this and I was like, oh, I should probably check in to see how this is done in our new, in our new teaching environment. So I kind of just kind of popped in so that I could get my mind activated because I do know that, you know, this is typically something that's going to pop up for new faculty in particular so that's perfect we've got and here it would probably, yeah. we've, we've got here some some people that have been teaching for a while so i'll uh, i'll direct a question what would you advise helen to do or where would you advise her to start look i saw a smile i feel like you have something um I'm not particularly <laughs> but um, well, I can say because I've um, took this particular type of teaching just about a year, two years ago. So I'm quite uh, getting used to this student population. Mm -hmm. I used to teach undergrads um, and a whole lot more kind of research and stats. Uh, so I did take what was done before for a year to really kind of fill it, you know, 
Um, and now I'm kind of in my second year, I have kind of different, di different kinds of cohorts and start changing from what I've learned um, last year, basically. I think it's a enormous task to do it, to make it your own for the, you know, in your first year. Um, take, what, take what's there, see how it fits with you and change it next year, basically. Um, yeah, that, that was my <laughs> way to go. That was exactly what I would have said. Don't recreate the wheel, take whatever the last professor did, do it exactly as they did it, and then adjust as you learn. And you'll adjust every year. I've been doing it for 16 years and every year, every term, I might change something. So, yeah, so um, not starting from the beginning is, uh, or not starting over is, is, is definitely a help uh, when it comes to our learning process as well as our ability to communicate to others what, what they need to learn, right? Um, in, in this process, however, th there are philosophies that are embedded with the way that we teach and the way that we speak about um, uh, the knowledge that we have and how to, to, to communicate that. Do you think that whenever you're building your classroom, for example, is it a, a, a more of a hierarchical way in which you're the teacher or also you take students and you try to level and reduce this hierarchy and uh, make them as, as knowledge producers as well? Is that a question for all of us? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I think the more, most exciting thing is to, to engage the students and kind of bring them on this journey to be knowledge producers. Um, how to do it is the question. <laughs> um, I feel like I mostly stumbled uh, really this year for the first time we we've, we've took the medical model to do a, a PBL. Uh, where they would go to breakout rooms, you know, over uh, several weeks, and they would work there on a problem-based um, uh, learning kind of model. Um, and sometimes it, for some groups it worked, it felt like they really got it, they knew kind of how to, mm -hmm. and, you know, other groups not so much. <laughs> so it's just, I, I, and I still don't know, you know, what, what made the difference really. Um, so it would be great to hear examples on how do we, what works when I try to make uh, the students kind of uh, knowledge producers. I think for us, we have to embed it in whatever program. So my PhD students are obviously writing a dissertation. So whatever they're doing in the coursework applies to their dissertation. In our master's human resource management, their big final capstone is a project for the agency that they're working for. So we try to make everything practical and related to, okay, if you were to research something and it's more evaluation than research in this agency, what would you, so it's really embedding it in the bigger picture of everything they need to do. And that way they see why they care to make it practical. And in those programs where students don't have a final dissertation or capstone or some way to tie it, um, I know they hate stats and I know they hate research methods. So I try to tell them why they should like it, like all the news media stuff that they get and how they can apply it in their real lives. They might not be producers of knowledge, but just why the heck they should care. So I guess it depends on the student body. Um, I also teach stats in uh, R. It's a, it's a statistical language. And sometimes it's really difficult to, to do exactly what you're saying is um, uh, find formats uh, in which uh, they can join, at, at least philosophically, the creation of methods. And one of the things that maybe it, it is a, applicable to, to my classes and maybe not applicable generally um, um, is, is the idea of, of providing a reproducible report. So we basically have data, we try to investigate it. And I think everybody on methods do this, um, uh, but also having uh, new data and data that you yourself haven't explored and, and you 
don't particularly know about the subject or something they pick in. So one of the things that we do do is uh, provide them with a list of data sets um, that uh, there are several, but um, on a given topic. And for example, I teach on communication science and there's about a, a repository of 300 data sets uh, that touches upon several subjects and they pick one up and they conduct their uh, methods course based on this data set from beginning to end. And the end goal is to uh, have a reproducible report by the end in which they do the stats and they talk about the, the, uh, the, the conclusions that they took. And uh, we all had one of those uh, actually being uh, uh, picked up for publishing, we were preparing it. So this could be an idea. Would that, would that at all be useful? Something I've done um, frequently with undergraduate students on a stats course is to um, allow them to, to go through the process of designing a, a survey and um, they they make mistakes as they go and then they learn from the mistakes they made so you know for example they'll they'll design a question and they'll get the they'll do the survey so everybody else in the class um, kind of feed, uh, gives them responses and they'll end up with a variable that's got some binary responses and some continuous responses so you get them to think about okay why has that happened what was it about your survey design that's that's led to that and then it's a kind of iterative process and they, they eventually by making mistakes um, learn how to collect data in a, in a more efficient way uh, so they can then go on to, to analyze that yeah that's so cool um, there's a professor at our institute that um, uh, instead of doing, there's a, a research seminar and he um, puts groups uh, in, and he divides the class into groups and they actually get, uh, uh, like you Paul, get to survey their own research questions. So everybody from the masters, they have a survey cohort and they actually survey Germans, uh, I mean here in Germany, and they survey, they develop their instruments they get to program it, they collect data, the, the Institute pays for it. And uh, it, it's just a, a, one of the ways that uh, we found to, to insert them in the producing knowledge uh, idea. I think that that's super cool that other people are doing the same. One thing I like to do, at least with my students and things I've participated in myself when I was an undergrad was the idea of you gave a pre-registration so you show like, hey, here's what these researchers proposed that they were going to do. Here's the final actual published article of what they did do and kind of run the analysis themselves and like start noting like what they said they were gonna do, the discrepancies, um, did they like bait and switch an outcome? Did they not report outcomes that they said they were going to? We're really getting them involved of again, the process of research, how research, like what researchers do, the idea of p-hacking, um, etc. I mean, I think we're all familiar with the activity of like, here's a data set, p hack away, and uh, see, like, give me the most outrageous thing you can find. But it like demonstrates to them by doing what it means to like play around with data, and unfortunately, like some effects um, that are just false positives because of that process. So that's definitely one idea. That one. That's pretty cool. Um, and so re re maybe related to that, but, um, and also related just generally to the topic of this breakout, the reproducibility in open science. I mean, data management is, is, is one of the pillars, I guess, of reproducible and open science. So um, is, is that like, do, do you teach that uh, in your classes? Do you have time to teach about data management in your classes and how do you do it or what are the uh, challenges there. I find that really tough because the, the data management takes 10 times as long as the, the analysis. Um, so it's it's difficult to, to go through the, the, the realistic process of, of managing a, a messy data set. Um, because we, we have to teach the, the, the nice shiny bit at the end. We, we had a, a comment 
by Shura um, that I think it, 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 uh, it really helps on the employment area. Um, when you train your students, uh, the processes of, of knowledge, they, they feel more empowered. And you also allows your students uh, to sort of aim or consider breaking that glass ceiling. They, they see science isn't that, that really big, um, monstrous. Uh, they, don't, they, they, they no longer have so much fear about uh, call themselves or, or imagine themselves as, as, a, as knowledge producers. And it, it can be a, a very pedagogical um, process to to walk them through this process and say, hey, I haven't, I didn't know about this, about the world, right? They are analyzing a specific data and you're like, that's super cool. And that I think also helps on the social side, especially when it comes to inclusion, diversity, equity, you help them uh, identify um, with that position that at least so society, societally speaking, you are in a position of power in relation to your students. So, that can be, hi, Shara. Um, so, uh, um, yeah, so that also helps uh, the process along, I think. Um, and students are very thankful uh, afterwards and it's an experience that they, they take on, um, I think, in my experience. So we, we've got about five more minutes, I think, and then we're going back into the main room and having a little panel discussion. Um, any, any other questions or highlights or anything that you feel like we should have talked about and we didn't? Uh, or uh, what you'd like to learn uh, or take away from this or a, another session or I don't know, something we, we want to, to help you find something that's really useful and applicable right now in your teaching. So I know you're not doing like the Sage sales pitch necessarily, but that might not be a bad session. Like what the different resources you already have that can be embedded and that would be something I'd attempt. Oh, cool, okay. Save our time and just do it for us. <laughs> <laughs> Instead of like, ah, I don't know, because changing becomes a really big, like, ah, I don't know if I want to go through all that. But yeah, a little pitch would be helpful. Yeah, cool, so yeah. like reduce that burden again. Yeah. If I could do a quick few four pitches as far as like initiatives that we do to yeah. help A teachers, because there's quite a bit that we didn't go through. One is the idea of because we care about open reproducible science and trying to like start intertwining that into the classroom, even though I know many of us are like, we don't have time. I think even Paul said like, it's hard enough trying to just teach the shiny outcome before even going through the messy process. Something we have as the template, so this isn't like, you know, the command or anything, is if I can get the link, a syllabus. I can get that, Jake. You can get that. Yeah. All right, so essentially the syllabus is just recommendations of how you can incorporate everyday open or Google science into the topics you already discuss. Um, in addition to that, if you're like me, you care about social justice and how to really democratize science for your students. So people who are underprivileged or come from underrepresented populations have the same access as to, you know, students here at the University of Alabama who come from like pretty affluent, privileged backgrounds and trying to even the um, playing field there. So Flavio, I'm sure you can find the link for kind of how for um, implements social justice, diversity, inclusiveness, equity into everyday um, practices. Um, I mentioned to Suzette before that we do have those 100 plus summaries projects, but we also have like an educational or educators corner, where again, it's people from the community sharing their experiences, their solutions and just kind of frustrations. So again, the good, the bad, the ugly when it comes to teaching open or reproducible science in the classroom. Um, and I think it's companies to know, like, again, we're not like in a silo, we're not in some random off island by ourselves, that there is a bunch of people we're struggling together. Um, and like I said, there's a community amongst us, right? I know some of us are from epidemiology, I'm from psychology. So when I heard about like clinical psych, health psych, IO psych, um, that was really cool. Um, but yeah, we're all in this together. Uh, 
Yeah, Jacob, it would be great if you can go, I mean, I know you've talked about this in the uh, video, but can, uh, go through some of the clusters. Um, I think it will be useful. Sure, so as what we call clusters are essentially like themes um, where, and Flavio can correct me wrong, this was created before I um, started being a volunteer for the organization, essentially around 50-ish experts who are like the leading frontiers we consulted and said like, hey, what are things we should be talking about in our classrooms? What themes come up that we should educate ourselves and our students? And as of today, we have seven clusters, themes ranging from the history of the open science movement. So if you guys are familiar with like Daryl Bem and his uh, ESP art. So like in 2011, he essentially published this paper in psychology saying that he has evidence for clairvoyance for psychics. And people thought it was a joke, but he was being serious. He was and being he serious. Was, yeah, he was using all the standard practices used in common data research, which shows that there was a flaw that science was broken. He brought a spotlight unintentionally to p hacking to the incentive structures that are going on in academia so like publish or perish um, and how people play around with their data and mess with their data not in a diabolical evil way but just the normal way of that, that we were all trained to do right no one really called it out as a problem and for the few people that did decades ago no one really paid them much attention so yeah. there's really systemic issues um, if i have one minute to wrap up just a few things is these things are things you can discuss with your students from, again, the history to if you're stats minded. And I think while we talked about R or if you're familiar with Jamovi, these free stats programming codes, how to make analyses reproducible and to have students actually like work with these analyses with real data. Hey, yeah, Jamovi, thank you for writing it out. Um, to pre-register your data. If a lot of you can share the clusters, oh, he already did. Really mm -hmm. take a look at those. Again, they're directly tied in with the database I shared earlier, so we can really educate ourselves and others. Okay, we have like 10 seconds. So let me just say that these clusters, uh, there are many ways to tax taxonomize and categorize open science and reproducible science research. This is educationally prone, so how you educate. So there are little tabs you can click and you can take topic part. And 